On this, the 82nd episode of What the Ship, will give you the top five maritime stories as of July 5th, 2023. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So a lot to look at this week. Man, every time, every time you think it's going to get quiet in the shipping industry, it doesn't. So what do we got? Well, we got a strike on the west coast of Canada. We've got issues with freight rates across the Pacific and over into Europe. We've got the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, having a conference on cutting greenhouse gas emissions from ships. We got Russia, Ukraine, and we have the christening of the first of five state maritime academy vessels in the United States. So if you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into story number one. Story number one takes us to Canada, specifically Canada Day on July 1st, where the members of the ILWU, the International Longshore Warehouse Union of Canada, announced they were going on strike, and they did. So we've seen a shutdown on all West Coast Canadian ports. Now, remember, we were talking about this for the United States with the ILWU versus the Pacific Maritime Association, but they have an agreement. We had that whole episode where we talked about it, but that agreement has now gone to the local unions for their vote on. But this is completely different. This is shutting down Canada's West Coast ports, which is going to severely impact Canadian uh, economy, because you're talking about the port of Vancouver, the largest port in of all Canada being shut down, and also Prince Rupert being shut down. And I should mention it is Prince Rupert, not Prince Ruprecht. I've made that mistake before. Prince Ruprecht, of course, is the greatest character in of, of, of all movies, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Pardon my trident. But what we have here is the statements from the two sides. I shouldn't laugh. It's a very important issue. But uh, you always need a little bit of levity here and there. This is the statement by the British Columbia Maritime Employers Association on July 3rd. I just want to read part of this to you. So the BC Maritime uh, Association is committed to reaching a fair and balanced deal with the ILWU Canada, one that recognizes the expertise of BC's waterfront workforce, which can get goods flowing as soon as possible for the benefit of Canada's economy and families. Uh, it talks about everything here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I want to jump down here. The ILWU Canada, this is what the BC MEA is saying, is attempting to aggressively expand their scope and redefine regular maintenance work far beyond what is set out in industry-wide agreement, which has been legally, legally well-established for decades. Changing this definition would result in immediate and significant impacts to terminal operations. Under the current collective agreement, the ILWU exclusively supplies the labor force. However, it has been consistently unable to fill the trades work they have jurisdiction over. It goes down here. BCMEA employee number members are proud to provide well-paying, family-supported jobs for BC longshore workers. For context, and this is where this always happens, this is going to tell you how much ILWU workers make. In 2022, the median salary of an ILWU union longshore worker in BC was $136,000 per year, plus benefits and pension. Over the course of the past 13 years, longshore wages have risen by 40% ahead of inflation at 30%. Okay, well, what's that recent number they don't go into details with? ILWU Canada members have increased by approximately 10% in the past three years since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Well, that's because rates have, I mean, the, the, the amount of cargo coming through has also increased. If you look at the ILWU response to this, this is their letter as of July 4th, the following day. On July 3rd, while, while the union was at the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Services waiting for a response from the employer, we received a message from the mediators that the BCME walked away from the table. The union delivered a message to the federal mediators that the union will not walk away from negotiations. We are available every day. The BCMEA is accusing the union of, of attempting to aggressively expand on its jurisdiction over regular maintenance work. This is completely false, and evidence that the association is deaf to the real and legitimate concerns 
concerns of the union. The key issue that is holding up getting a deal is contracting out of ILWU maintenance work by member employees of the BCMEA and the refusal of the association and its member co companies to agree on a regular maintenance document is all but a complete except for one sentence. Our jurisdiction in maintenance has been aggressively eroded by member employees by using third-party contractors. This is not an issue of cost for the direct employees because they already pay for this work to be done by maintenance contracting companies. In fact, using ILWU skilled trade employees will be more cost effective and result in a higher work quality of work because of the industry experience and competency. So this is obviously a sore point between the two sides. Both of them are talking past each other, hence the reason for the reconciliation and mediating coming in. This is the problem you have. It really is. Both of these sides have their issue. It sounds like it's fairly close to where they want to be, but now you have both sides pointing fingers at each other, and it's really tough to come to the table, especially if the BCMEA has walked away from it and are pointing fingers at the ILWU. The minute they start quoting salaries, that's meant to get people on their side. I, I don't think that's a good use of tactics, to tell you the truth. Because everybody wants to get paid more. I think if people are being paid more, that's great. You know, let them be paid what they're worth. Uh, but I think the argument is being lost here, especially if you're just talking about maintenance and resolving that. But what this means for Canada is really important. This story from Bloomberg synopsizes it in one sentence. Dock worker strike at Canada's biggest ports to fuel inflation. It is going to cost more money to move goods. We saw what happened when Canada's uh, West Coast ports shut down because of the Fraser River flooding and the shutdown that happened back in 2022. That was catastrophic. I mean, you couldn't move grain, you couldn't move ore, couldn't move anything. Now you have the ports completely shut down. But what's really interesting is the ports aren't completely shut down. There's one area where ships are coming in and out, and that's the passenger trade. I don't understand why passenger trade is still operating because I thought the ILWU controls the, the luggage and the freight going on and off these vessels. But it seems as if that trade is still going on. Now, obviously, they don't want to lose those vessels coming through because these are ships that largely originate in the United States coming into Canada and heading up to Alaska under the Passenger Vessel Service Act, which was waived for a brief period during COVID. So obviously they don't want to lose that. So there is a lot of politics. There's a lot of maneuvering going on here. I don't pick sides in these arguments. I really don't. I think both sides have legitimate claims and issues at play. The ports want more efficiency. They want more automation. The dock workers want protection for their workers. They want to make sure they're getting paid what they're deserved. And I think most importantly, Canadians want their freight moving. They want their cargo moving. So there's always stuff moving. There's ore coming in, and you just can't shift this down to U.S. ports. It's not going to work that way. The grain elevators, the coal, uh, the ore storage isn't there. It's got to come out through Vancouver and Prince Rupert. So you have to be able to move it. So a lot going on with this story. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number two. Story number two is the container sector. This story from Lodestar over in G-Captain, MSC lead Trans-Pacific Capacity Exodus as Zim bucks the trade. So Mediterranean Shipping Company, the largest shipping company in the world right now, is basically shifting. Ocean carriers have removed almost a quarter of their capacity from the Trans-Pacific trade lane in the past year as freight rates have sunk below pre-pandemic level. Goes on here, the consultant said that the Asia North America exodus has been led by the world's largest carrier, MSC, which has reduced its capacity on the Trans Pacific by 35% year on year, while 2M partner Maersk has taken out 19%. This has to do with the ridiculously low freight rate coming across the Pacific. This is, this is exactly what this has to do. And one of the things we're seeing is that some, some lines are changing this. Maersk just upped their rates going across the Pacific. But this route is really important because MSC is shifting its cargo from Asia to the east and Gulf Coast of the United States, either going through the Panama Canal or through the Suez Canal on the ultra-large container vessels. You see that here in this freight wave story by Henry Byers, critical level approaching for trans-Pacific spot rates. They continue to slide down below year-end levels. Add to this, this story also from Lodestar, a container ship charter market loses steam as carriers look to off-hire ships. 
So a lot of vessels that have been chartered or leased, they're, they're, they're bleeding them out of their fleets right now, going back down to the core fleets, the vessels they own and the vessels that they have long-term charters with. The short-term vessels are going to go away. And again, we keep talking about this and it's been slow to happening, but we're starting to see that uptick in vessel scrapping that we knew was going to happen start to go on, especially as these new ships begin to enter in 2023, going through 2025. And finally, this Greg Miller story, container shipping trilemma, weak rates, new ships, pricey charters, Zim reportedly seeks early charter terminations, considers sublets. So you're seeing right here, everything come together, this, 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 these three issues coming in, the weak rates, these new ships entering in, and then these ch charter rates that container lines were going back, those NOOs, those non uh, uh those uh, non-owner oper uh, non-operator owners, excuse me, uh, the people who lease vessels, C-SPAN, Atlas, uh, uh, Custom Air, all of them got people to lease their vessels for long leases, uh, so that they would be available for a long time, which is great. I mean, it's like like renting out a U-Haul, and they're leased. They don't have to worry about what's in them or not. They just rent them out, and that's what has happened. But some of these companies have been stuck with these leases for a long time, and it's going to be a big issue of whether they can clear them off their books. It's going to severely impact the container market right now. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number three. Story number three involves our favorite organization of all times, the International Maritime Organization. That's right, the UN shipping arm. Well, the IMO is having their MEPC 80 conference this week, and we're getting back reports. Got to be clear, my favorite report from this conference was here's a conference talking about energy utilization and greenhouse gases. And it seems like they invited too many people to the conference because there was not enough seats to sit down in the conference. And then all the reporters and journalists who were invited, there were not enough outlets, plugs to plug in all their their, their computer and, and hardware to operate. And so I guess they were going for green efficiency at the meeting, which seems to be the case here. This story in G-Captain on the first day is by Barry Parker. The main task of revising the IMO strategy for shipping decarbonization, the reduction of greenhouse gases, is in the hands of the Intercessional Working Group on Reducing GHG. There's the title that rolls right off the tongue. Chaired by Norway's, I won't say a Norwegian name, which met during week prior to MPAC 80 and will continue its deliberations meeting each day separately from the plenary meeting. So you've got the plenary meetings and then you have these separate meetings going on. By the end of the week, when MPAC 80 is set to wrap up the working group, which will have hopefully ironed out the nuts and bolts of the new strategy, will present it to the broader assemblage. That's what we're going to wait to see. Bloomberg story also over in G Captain. Nations haggle over targets to cut shipping emissions going on here. Shipping industry faces net zero emissions draft, draft plan reveal. So we're already talking about this idea that IMO 2050 is not going to be a 50% reduction in greenhouse emissions, but a 100% reduction in greenhouse emissions, which again, I have the answer to. I am all set. It's called a sailor boat. It's all you need. That's right. We will take the ever a lot, which can carry 24,000 containers and just put masts and sails on it and off you go, which will not work. You are trying to decarbonize the largest objects ever made by humans. We can't do that with cars right now in, in, in America or a lot of countries. This is really tough. Understand this. Because of the amount of energy we get from petroleum, it is hard to replace that. And making vessels go completely zero emission is really, really difficult, I have to say. And yet that's the challenge we're doing. And also understand where we're at in this cycle. It is 2023. You're talking about 27 years until you hit 2050. Lifespan of vessels is 15 to 25 years. So whatever ships you're building right now are interim ships. But the question is, will that interim ship last its full life cycle or will you hit 2030, 2035 and have to get rid of a vessel that you just bought and have used only for 10 years because now you got to meet new, new standards? This is really, really tough. And this is being shul shouldered by private companies, too. We're really pointing out usually that this innovation and technology and, and propulsion comes out of governments and, and you know, there, there's something else that generates this. Do we really want Maersk, MSC, CMA, CGM, ONE and these companies being, you know, 
the technology drivers for how we propel these vessels. This, it seems to be a little bit backwards to me that, that, that we're working on this, but this is the issue that's being absolutely rammed down shipping's throat is to get cleaner and cleaner. Now, understand, it has cleaned up tremendously the shipping industry in terms of pollution and wrecks and you name it. It has become a much, much cleaner industry. Is it perfect? No, 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 no. It is not. It is nowhere near perfect. But again, the big issue here is going to be how do you get to this you know, fantasy level uh, by creating ships over 1,300 feet long that don't produce any emissions. I, I just don't know how you get to that point right now. It's great to be aspirational, but you also have to be practical, which sometimes doesn't seem to be what IMO is doing. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number four. Story number four is going to deal with Russia and Ukraine, and it's an old story that we've seen Time and time again, we are at a point again where the Ukraine grain deal is about to expire. And we're potentially seeing Russia withdraw entirely from this deal. And so you're seeing a lot of issues start coming up. So, for example, this one, a Reuters story over in G-Captain, the EU proposes a Russian grain bank. The idea here is considering a proposal for the Russian Agricultural Bank to set up a subsidiary to reconnect to the global financial network as a sop to Moscow, the Financial Times said on Monday. With the bank under sanctions, the move aims to safeguard Black Sea grain deal that allows Ukraine to export food to the global market. Yes, this sets up a, a grain bank for Russia with the intent to try to keep them into the Ukraine grain deal. Same time you're seeing this, Russia is all but out of the Black Sea grain deal. We really need to get new pictures here, people. We're using the same pictures over and over again. Russia said on Friday it saw no reason to extend the Black Sea grain deal beyond July 17th because the West has acted in such a, quote, outrageous way. Outright, yes, the West is outrageous over the agreement, but assured poor countries that Russia grain exports would continue. The UN and Turkey brokered the Black Sea grain initiative last July to tackle this, uh, and it has been ongoing ever since. The deal allows food and fertilizer to be exported from three Ukrainian ports. The green agreement has been extended three times. At the same time, it ensures the free flow of Russian food and fertilizer. And what Russia has basically argued is that their food and fertilizer is not free flowing. It's being impeded. And therefore, why should they agree to this? Now, fuel is a whole different issue that's being handled under the price caps we're going to talk about here in a second. But this, this whole issue is getting ready to implode, I think. I really think we're reading, reaching the pivot point here on where this deal is going to go. If Russia backs out of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, understand there's a couple of things that, that happens here. Number one, Ukraine just keeps flowing grain out. Basically, ships go up to Ukraine, load the grain, and come out. Question is, what does Russia do about that? If Russia suspects that ships going up in Ukraine are carrying munitions and arms, they will target them and potentially sink them. Uh, they may target vessels coming out of Ukraine. We don't know. And if Russia starts targeting ships going to and from Ukraine, then what's to stop Ukraine from targeting ships going to and from Russia? We've already seen attacks by those Ukrainian uh, uh, drone vessels, uh, the, basically the kamikaze kayaks that are out there that are just ramming into vessels. What's going to stop this turning the Black Sea into the Persian Gulf of the 1980s? I, I, I don't think a lot. And I think that's the big scenario fear. I also have to mention that there's a lot of people now writing about, you know, what should NATO and the U.S. be doing on the Black Sea? Can I be clear that John Conrad and I have been talking about this for over a freaking year and we got a rash of crap from people for talking about this talking about the fact that, oh, NATO and the U.S. Navy shouldn't do anything in the Black Sea. And now the mainstream people within that area is talking about it. Just, you know, again, not, not prophesizing, but it all comes back to the commercial aspect. That's the issue here. I'm not, uh, believe me, I, I don't foresee the future. And I'm not a very smart guy. But one thing I saw very clearly is when you start interdicting trade coming out of a region, it's going to have an impact. And the idea that trade is local is not true when it comes to oceans, especially the Black Sea. Just because it's a cul-de-sac on the edge of the Mediterranean doesn't mean it doesn't involve anyone. Brings you over to the oil issue coming out of Russia. 
Russia's rusty oil tanker fleet sets sail with newer ships. So we're seeing a change in what was the Dark Fleet. The Dark Fleet has been identified as these, these older vessels being used, sailing below the radar, hauling Russian oil and diesel fuel around the world and violating the price cap. Well, now what we're seeing is, is much newer ships are being used in this. This is a Bloomberg story that kind of talks about this. And I think that's really important, which means it's normalizing and, and mainstreaming the Russian fuel exports. Add to this, we're seeing a shift away from these oil transfers off of Spain, but they're moving to other places, moving out in the Atlantic, moving off the uh, coast of Malaysia where the Pablo exploded moving into the Mediterranean and other places so that Russian oil transfers are still full bore. If you didn't see the, the articles in the New York Times that focused on this, to get the New York Times to put not once but twice articles about tankers on the cover is absolutely amazing. Uh, Sam Samir Madani over at Tanker Trackers helped with that story. I just did a uh, space talk with him over on Twitter. And Samir's work is absolutely stellar, outstanding. You cannot do better than that. Tanker Trackers has visually identified nearly every tanker in the world, 4,000 of them. And they can track them through open source intelligence, through satellite Im imagery, and ensure that vessels are going exactly where they need to go for insurance companies and for brokers and for purchasers of oil. Don't rely on AI AIS because, again, for some strange friggin' reason, the one thing we don't have the IMO mandate is that AIS has to be on at all times, cannot be turned off, so that you can track vessels internationally. But no, we don't have that because what you can do is basically go up to an AIS unit on every ship and unplug it and go dark or spoof it and send you somewhere. Why we don't mandate this? Again, I, I, what do I know? I'm just a simple YouTuber. All right, let's go ahead and head over to our next story. All right, our fifth and last story is one that I always pick is the most interesting, I find. There's a lot of stories out there. Believe me, I could have given you a dozen more stories that we should have talked about this week. But I want to talk about this story, and that is the christening of the training ship Empire State 7. This is the story over in G-Captain. Marad names Marilyn Pilot as sponsor of First National Training Ship. Mike Schuller wrote this story. So Philadelphia Shipyard, Philly Shipyard, is building five what are called national multi-mission uh, security vessels. And these vessels are being built for five of the six state maritime academies, New York Maritime being the first, uh, Massachusetts, Maine, uh, Texas, and California. Great Lakes on Michigan doesn't get one of these because they're too big. They should get a ship. They need to get a ship. I don't understand why they don't. And the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, the Federal Academy, doesn't get one of these ships because their midshipmen go out on uh, commercial vessels. But this vessel, the Empire State 7, replaces Empire State 6, which is a former cargo ship. And the sponsor for the vessel is the vice president of the Maryland Pilots, Beth Chrisman, who I actually know. Beth was two years ahead of me at SUNY Maritime College. So I know Beth. And so uh, a big role for the Maryland Pilots. But the thing I want to talk about here is, man, this was kind of under the radar. There wasn't a lot of press associated with this. There's a big event, the christening and building of this ship, because the very unique way they built this ship. This ship was not being built by the U.S. Maritime Administration. What the Maritime Administration did was contract with a commercial firm, Tote. What Tote did is they got a contractor out there, designed this vessel, and then they went to Philly Shipyard, among other shipyards, and, and got them to build it. And what we're seeing is the building of a ship on time, in contract. They're a little late, but it's the first of five ships. You're going to see them coming in late. And so the vessel is, is coming out there, a very novel, innovative way to contract, manage, and build a vessel is coming out. So I thought it was really interesting that, number one, Beth Chrisman was the uh, uh, sponsor for the vessel. Uh, the Maryland Pilots, uh, I'm not sure if they're the biggest fan of me after I did a, a, a video about Everforward that got a little bit of attention where I talked about one of their pilots. But again, 
And I think it was my funniest performance ever on what's going on with shipping. I will have the link uh, in the show notes uh, for you. Uh, it was a great reenactment of Ever Forward's grounding. But the other one is this story that John Conrad penned to go with this, navigating the information fog engulfing American shipyards. And John Conrad has been very critical of the American maritime industry in certain areas, and particularly the Maritime Administration. Uh, and he wrote a piece uncovering the ghost admiral steering the U.S. government's most secretive agency. Uh, and uh, while John writes a great piece and it's really interesting to do it, I do have an issue that John raises in here that I want to go a little bit further. Is that why, why would we not talk about this issue more? This should have been a huge press event. A massive press event. This is an amazing thing that's being done. We're building training vessels for each of the five state coastal maritime academies. Again, Michigan, sorry. Uh, Great Lakes Maritime is not on there. Uh, but also, these vessels will be used for humanitarian operations and rescue operations. They're kind of uh, have this kind of uh, feature that they can be used for that role. I also think they're prime candidates for the U.S. Navy to be converted into or, or to take this design and build more ships like these for hospital ships, for command vessels, for tenders, you name it. I think the model here is the one we should be looking at. Uh, we just saw, for example, the uh, awarding of uh, contracts for what's called TSP. This is the tanker security program and a whole series of contracts to replace the Red Hill facility out in Hawaii with tankers. But almost all those tankers are foreign built. They're U.S. flag, but they're foreign built. Why are we not building new tankers under this agreement? Why are we not using this system right here to build new tankers and fill the fleet? There are critical issues. John raises this in the article along with many other issues. But I think this is the issue. And again, why are you not? Why was this event not covered by all the major news medias? Uh, I know G Captain wasn't invited to it because John writes about that in here. I wasn't invited to it, but again, I'm just a dumpy little YouTube channel. I understand that, but you know, I am a graduate of the State University of New York Maritime College. Uh, I have been a big proponent of these vessels. I've talked about them, I've done videos on them. I wrote a piece about the Philadelphia shipyard and these vessels and why they're important. They literally built these vessels in a dry dock that was designed to build Montana class battleships. I think this is a great element here for talking about restructuring, rebuilding the U.S. Merchant Marine. And again, I, I think we fail in getting this out into the public mindset that this is being done. Understand the five state maritime academies lobbied, and I mean lobbied. They put money together, about 200 grand a piece every year to put a million dollar, million dollar fund together so that they can lobby Congress so that they can build these replacement vessels. And they still have this going on, by the way. And I think that money should be being used to educate and spread the news about the U.S. maritime sector, which is not being done on a routine basis. I think we need more information out there about what the maritime sector does, how it contributes to the U.S. economy, and what's available out there for Americans to get involved in that. I think the supply chain crisis was a huge wake-up call for everybody across the country on how important global shipping is. And yet we don't seem to be embracing it the way we should. And I think that is a huge net loss for the United States. Other countries are embracing it. We see that all the time. China, Japan, Korea, building 94% of the world shipping. You see that being done. You see other countries talking about national fleets being resurrected and rebuilt. I think we need that type of argument going forward. And I think that this vessel, along with the four follow-on, and hopefully more after that, would do that, maybe with future tankers or roll-on, roll-off ships, following the model of how you built Empire State 7. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit that super thanks button down below. We can give a one-time contribution to the page or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. This is how I keep myself afloat by doing this job in the summertime like this. Uh, you know, come August, I go back, I uh, turn into a pumpkin. I got to go back to teaching. But right now, this is my focus. I try to get as many episodes as I can done now, but still continue on here over the summer and into the fall and spring. Until our next episode, this is Sal signing off.